Imagine if you woke up one day to find that your ancestral property inherited through generations is no longer yours. It has been declared Vakf property and now you need permission from the Vakf board to sell or transfer it. If you think this sounds like an exaggerated story, think again. This is a reality faced by many landowners across India where the Vakf board holds unparalleled power over land ownership and property rights. The story of Vakf in India is both astonishing and alarming. Vakf, defined under Section 3R of the Vakf Act 1995, refers to the permanent dedication of property, either movable or immovable, for purposes recognized by Muslim law as pious or charitable. It is essentially a trust for charitable causes under Islamic law, designed to benefit communities. The twist? In India, the Vakf Board has emerged as the third largest landholder after the Indian Railways and the Defence. As of August 2023, Vakf properties in India spanned 9.4 lakh acres, an area larger than some countries. This raises a pressing question. How did the Vakf Board amass so much land? And why does it seem to operate beyond the norms that govern other religious institutions? Interestingly, Muslim-majority countries like Saudi Arabia, Turkey and Egypt do not have Vakf boards or Vakf-specific laws. So why does India, a secular country, have one? In contrast, Hindu temples and other religious institutions are not given the same autonomy. Hindu temples are managed by the government under laws such as the Madras Hindu Religious and Endowments Act, which brought these religious places under state control. This inequity is glaring. Article 26 of the Indian Constitution guarantees all religious denominations the right to manage their affairs. Yet, it appears this right is selectively enforced. One of the most controversial aspects of the Vakf Act is the unchecked authority of Vakf boards to declare private property as Vakf. Under Section 40 of the Vakf Act, the board can declare any property as Vakf after an internal inquiry. And this decision is final unless contested in a Vakf tribunal. A particularly egregious case occurred in Thiruchendurai, Tamil Nadu, where an entire village, including a 1500-year-old Hindu temple, was declared Vakf property by the Tamil Nadu Vakf board, despite the absence of any Muslim population or historical ownership by Muslims. Rajagopal, a farmer in the village, found himself unable to sell his 1.2-acre plot of land without first securing a no-objection certificate from the Vakf board. This power to declare private property as Vakf without any external checks leads to a serious question. Should a religious body have the power to alter property rights in a secular democracy? And should the government be funding the surveys and administrative costs of the Vakf board's land claims, as it currently does? If your property is declared Vakf, your legal recourse is limited. Civil courts have no jurisdiction over Vakf matters. Your only option is to appeal to a Vakf tribunal. But the decisions of these tribunals are final. This has led to accusations of a parallel judicial system where the Vakf board operates with extraordinary powers outside the normal legal framework. Unlike other religious communities where disputes can be addressed in civil courts, Vakf-related grievances are stuck in a system where the odds are stacked against the individual property owner. The composition of Vakf boards adds another layer of concern. All members, including the CEOs of state Vakf boards, must be Muslim. There is no representation from other communities or even non-Muslim stakeholders who might be affected by Vakf land claims. This exclusivity raises questions about fairness and transparency. 
Even within the Muslim community, the boards are divided along sectarian lines with separate boards for Shia and Sunni Muslims, excluding others like the Dawoodi Bohras or Ahmadiyas. The Waqf board's land claims extend beyond private property. Public parks, government buildings and even national monuments have been claimed as Waqf property. In Uttar Pradesh, the Waqf board laid claim to a public park dedicated to freedom fighter Chandrasekhar Azad and in Surat, the municipal headquarters was declared Waqf property because it was reportedly constructed during the Mughal era. The Uttar Pradesh Sunni Central Waqf Board even attempted to claim ownership of the Taj Mahal, asserting that it was a Waqf property based on an alleged Waqf deed from Shah Jahan. The Supreme Court dismissed the claim, but the fact that such claims can be made highlights the extent of the Waqf Board's reach. Despite controlling assets worth billions, Waqf boards have a low income, contributing less than 200 crore rupees annually. This discrepancy suggests that Waqf properties are either mismanaged or their income is concentrated in the hands of a few, failing to benefit the poor Muslims for whom these endowments were originally intended. Adding to the financial opacity, Waqf boards are exempt from the Rent Control Act and receive tax exemptions, while government funds are sometimes used to pay the salaries of Waqf board employees, an arrangement that raises questions about the separation of religion and state. Another contentious issue is the exemption Waqf properties enjoy under the Limitation Act, which typically governs how long after an event legal proceedings may be initiated. This means that Waqf boards can claim property as theirs, no matter how many years have passed, while no such privilege exists for other communities. In contrast, Hindu religious institutions are restricted from claiming their historical religious sites under the Places of Worship Act 1991, further highlighting the preferential treatment afforded to Waqf boards. Issues surrounding Waqf in India are complex, touching on property rights, religious freedoms and legal equity. The unchecked power of Waqf boards to declare private property as Waqf, the lack of financial transparency and the absence of legal recourse for affected individuals are all alarming. At its core, the Waqf system needs reform to ensure it serves its original purpose of benefiting the needy without infringing on the rights of others. So where do we go from here? Should Waqf boards be brought under stricter regulatory oversight? Should the same rules apply to all religious institutions, ensuring equality before the law? These are pressing questions that need to be answered. If India is to balance the interests of all its citizens while respecting its secular fabric. If you found this video insightful, do let us know your thoughts in the comments below. Until next time, this is Rich Adivedi signing off. Dhanivad and Namaste.